All right, Jesus, bless this message in Jesus' name I pray. Thank you, Father God. Thank you so much, Lord. I give you praise, honor, and glory today and every other day. I pray that the people will hear your word and your message. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Trust me and don't be afraid, for I am your strength and your song. Do not let fear dissipate your energy. Instead, invest your energy in trusting me and singing in my song. The battle for control of your mind is fierce, and fears of worry have made you vulnerable to the enemy. So, you need to be vigilant in guarding your thoughts. Do not despise the weakness in yourself, since I am using it to draw you closer to me. Your constant need for me creates an intimacy that's well worth all the effort. You're not alone in your struggle for your mind. My spirit living within you is ever ready to help in this striving. Ask him to control your mind, y'all. He'll bless you with life and peace in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father God. You can read Isaiah 12, 2, Romans 8, 9, Romans 8, 6. Thank you, Daddy God, Lord Jesus. Don't walk in fear, y'all. Don't let fear control your mind. Stay in the word. Trust the Lord. All right, going to talk about a time of Jacob's trouble, which you'll read about it. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Okay, on September 2nd, 1945, General Douglas MacArthur and representatives of the Japanese government met aboard the battleship called Missouri. Right? They signed an agreement formalizing the unconditional surrender of Japan. World War ended. World War II, it ended. And as the ink dried, poverty and starvation ran rampant, right? So Europe laid in ruin. Devastation haunted islands throughout the Pacific, and the dead totaled 50 million people, right? 20 million in the Soviet Union alone. The ashes of 6 million European Jews filled the crematoriums in places with names like Auschwitz, Dachau, Treblinka, right? <clears throat> so the suffering and the death of World War II is a very difficult thing to imagine, right? Survivors, they recount stories of unspeakable terror and unchecked evil, y'all. Never has the world suffered on such a mass scale at the same time. Mm -mm. How could you survive? How could the world survive another war like that? Much less endure the suffering again, that kind of suffering again. How? 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 How is it going to happen? Well, sadly, Jesus said another time is going to be worse than that. Worse than that, y'all. Yep. He described it this way in Matthew 24, 21. For there will be greater anguish than at any time since the world began, and it will never be so great again. Get it? World War II, man, seemed, it was bad, to, you know, even though I wasn't born here for it, but I know about it. I went to school, hear about it all the time, how bad it was. We got parents and grandparents. Jesus said, going to be a time worse than that. Take a moment, think about that. All the horrors of World War II, the death camps, the atomic bombs, millions dead, Cities reduced to rubble, women, children, infants, executed in, in mass, starved, shot, gassed, thrown into raging fire, y'all, tossed into mass graves. What could possibly be any worse than that? Yet Jesus said, a coming time will be worse, worse than that. In Jeremiah 30, verse 7, Jeremiah called it, the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, the Bible uses many names to describe it. Which includes, I wrote those names down. You pause the video and read these if you want to, y'all. Pause and read it. There you go. I wrote them all down for you with the Bible. Because start at the top. The day of calamity in Deuteronomy 32-35. The day of the Lord 
in Isaiah 2, 12, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, the terror of the Lord, Isaiah 2, 19, a day of reckoning, Isaiah 2, 12, the day of the Lord's vengeance, Isaiah 34, 8, a day of wrath, Zephaniah 1, 15, a day of trouble and distress, Zephaniah 1, 15, a day of destruction and desolation, Zephaniah 1, 15, a time of trouble, Daniel 12, 1, the great and terrible day of the Lord, Joel 2, verses 11 and 31, a day of darkness, Joel 2, 2, the wrath to come, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, the hour of temptation, Revelation 3.10, the great day of the wrath of the Lamb, Revelation 6, verses 16 through 17. The hour of judgment, Revelation 14, 7. And the wrath of God, Revelation 15, 1. Okay, but over there in the far corner over there, in the far right corner, Moses gave it another name. He called it the tribulation, Deuteronomy 4, 30. Right, the tribulation. It's also known as the end times, or the last days, you know, which is what we're talking about here. So, <clears throat> look this up. So, what is the tribulation? What happens in this unique time period? Well, the tribulation is a time of extreme physical and spiritual turmoil among the nations. It's a time of God's wrath, Zephaniah 1.15, a time when God will pour out his judgments on the world in Joel 3.2. Unlike God's past uh, judgments, the tribulation isn't reserved for only one nation or a few nations. It impacts all nations, Isaiah 2.10-17, all the earth, Zephaniah 1.18, and all the wicked Psalm 75, 8. <clears throat> it's got a huge impact. Two-thirds of the Jewish people will die. Zechariah 13, 8 through 9. One half of all humanity is going to die. Starting with the death of one-fourth of the world's population. Revelation 6, 8. And followed later by the death of one-third of those who remain. Revelation 9, 18. So millions and millions will face martyrdom for their belief in Jesus Christ. That's Revelation 6, 11 and Revelation 7, 14. So there's going to be many people here during some of this. It'll be a time of global war, global government, global dictator, right? People are going to live in rebellion against God. Living in rebellion, okay? Against God. And they're unrest... Strained wickedness will provoke a series of divine judgments, y'all. Continually living, continuously living in wickedness and doing wicked and provoking God's judgments. Yes. And these start with the seal judgments. Okay, and I've done a video for you on the seals. Well, let's just quickly go through a little bit. Just real quick. Some people think that the early days of the tribulation are, are a, a time of, you know, relative peace. Right? Well, they're not. They're not. The tribulation begins with the seal judgments. And these seal judgments plunge the worlds into global war and chaos. Okay? They launch the tribulation and the career of a, of a great conqueror. Revelation 6, 1 through 2. They bring global war, okay? The Bible describes this as a time of war and slaughter everywhere in Re Revelation 6, 3, and 4. Widespread famine, on, you know, follows this global war, Revelation 6, 5 through 6. And one-fourth of humanity dies, Revelation 6, 7 through 8. All right, does any of this sound calm or peaceful to you? Mm-mm. The remaining sealed judgments bring more suffering and, and terrible, more, more terrible events, y'all. 
And this includes, you know, great the great earthquakes and Revelation 6, 12, the stars falling to the earth, Revelation 6, 13, mountains and islands moving from their places in Revelation 6, 14. But sadly, all these terrible events are just the start, just the start of what's coming. Just the start of it. <clears throat> then you've got the trumpet judgments. The seal judgments unleash some of the greatest suffering in human history, but it only gets worse. The trumpet judgments come next, y'all. Okay? Let me fix this. <clears throat> All right. These judgments unleash a storm of hail and fire mixed with blood. One third of the earth is set on fire. One third of the trees are burned. All the green grass is burned. That's Revelation 8, 7. Then a great mountain of fire, a great mountain of fire is thrown into the oceans. One third of the oceans become blood. One third of the creatures in the ocean die and one third of all the ocean uh, ships are destroyed. Revelation 8, 8 through 9. As the trumpet judgments continue... A great star falls from the sky. It falls on a third of the rivers and springs of water. Do you understand? Springs of bad disease that we, you, you can't find the water, y'all. No water. We live off of water. But it falls on a third of the rivers and springs of water. One third of the water becomes bitter. And many of those who drink it die. Revelation 8, 10 through 11. Then, and then, there's a then, one third of the sun and the moon and the stars turn dark. Revelation 8, 12. And then, if you got some more and then, y'all, a bottomless pit opens up and smoke pours out of it. The sunlight is blocked and the air turns dark from the smoke. Revelation 9, 1 through 2. Uh, two. Does this describe a, a massive volcanic eruption? Yeah, very well may. Very well may. Has this been happening? Show sure has. But what comes next, you know, isn't is not a typical... What comes next is not typical of a uh, volcanic eruption. Because next comes the locusts emerge from the smoke and descend on the earth. <clears throat> okay. So these locusts have power to sting like scorpions, Revelation 9, 3. But if you've noticed some of those uh, volcanic eruptions that's been going on, y'all, if you've been looking at, if your spiritual eyes is open, you can see, you can see the spirits coming up out of them volcanoes. If your spiritual eyes is open, it's plain as day, very plain as day. The bowels of hell have been opened, y'all, on this earth. <clears throat> but these locusts have the power to sting like scorpions, Revelation 9.3. They don't attack trees or plants. Right? They only attack people. But they spare the followers of Jesus. So the followers are here. You understand? During these seals and stuff. They can't, they, they're not to attack the followers. If you're sealed by Jesus, they can't touch you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Everybody else, you know, endures five months of painful torture. All right. The stings of these locusts are so bad, people want death. They long for death as an escape, but they can't find it. Revelation 9 6. So, as if that weren't bad enough, or weren't enough, the next trumpet judgment brings even more terror, y'all. An army of 200 million horse-mounted troops descend on the earth. These horses have heads like lions. They spit fire, smoke, and burning sulfur from their mouth. The tails have heads like snakes with the power to uh, injure people. Their tails have heads like snakes that has power to injure you. 
This army kills one third of all the people on the earth. Revelation 9, 13 through 19. Yet despite the horror of it all, there's still more to come. The final trumpet judgment announces the arrival of a new uh, series of terrors. A new series of terrors. That's not enough right there. The bold judgments. Now you've got the bold judgments. Okay, the bold judgments. It's a miracle anyone survives the seven, you know, the sealed trumpet judgments. Yes, but they do. They do. They do. Based on current world population figures, several billion people will still be alive. Those who remain are going to endure seven more judgments. Seven more. <laughs> I'm serious. And these are just as terrible, y'all, if not worse than the previous judgments. They began with a horrible sore. Sores outbreaking on everyone who accepts the mark of the beast and worships the Antichrist statue. Revelation 6, 2, I mean 16, 2, Revelation 16, 2. The next bowl of God's wrath is poured out on the oceans, and the oceans become like the blood of a corpse, and everything in them dies. Everything in them dies. Revelation 16, 3. And shortly after that, all the world's rivers become springs of blood. Now all the water is affected. All of it. All of it. Revelation 16, 4. Then the sun scorches everyone with its fire. This blast of heat burns everybody in the world, yet they still, y'all, still refuse to turn to God. Wow. Revelation 16, 8 through 9. It's like, wow. After, afterwards, the world is plunged into darkness. Here comes your darkness. People grind their teeth in anguish, y'all. They're gritting their teeth. They curse God for all their pain and sores in Revelation 16, 10 through 11. This darkness don't happen until in the tribulation period, y'all. Understand that. That's why all these people have been yelling out, three days of darkness, three days of darkness. Gonna happen in April, gonna happen in March. That's why it didn't happen. Because it happens in the tribulation. We're not in it yet. We're in the birth pains. Then the Euphrates River dries up and the kings uh, from the east march their armies west without any obstacle. That's Revelation 16, 12. And what's their purpose? To gather all the rulers of the world to battle against the Lord himself. Revelation 16, 14. The seventh and the final bold judgment brings massive, massive dis destruction, y'all. A great earthquake strikes. The Bible calls it the greatest earthquake in human history, okay? Revelation 16, 18. It levels out, y'all. Levels out all the mountains of the world. And all of the islands disappear. This is a massive earthquake like the world has never seen. Never seen. Anyway, it levels out the mountains and the, and the uh, islands disappear. Revelation 16, 20. And then a terrible hailstorm follows, you know, like, like hailstones weighing as much as 75 pounds fall from the sky onto the people below, y'all. And once again, what do the people do? They curse God. Revelation 16, 21. While all these judgments taking place, a global dictator is going to be ruling the earth, y'all. One man. Revelation 13, 7. He's going to demand your worship. He's going to demand worship. Revelation 13, 15. And he's going to gain complete control over every transaction in the global economy. Revelation 13, 17. The tribulation will also uh, feature these two witnesses who speak on God's behalf. You know, each will have the power to send fire from his mouth and shut the sky so it won't rain. Turn the rivers and oceans into blood. Strike the earth with plagues, Revelation 11, 5-6, right? So you can see now why the tribulation is one of the most talked about time periods in the Bible, right? Like birth pains in Matthew 24, 8 is talking about. 
all these um, epic events are going to lead up to the greatest event in human history. The greatest event, y'all, is yet to come. The return of our Lord Jesus Christ, y'all. At the end of the tribulation, Jesus will come to the earth, conquer his enemies, judge the nations, and reign as king for a thousand years. Now, how long is the tribulation? And believe it or not, <laughs> all these events take place in a, in a single seven-year period. Seven years. Seven years, y'all. Cram all that mess in there in a seven-year period. Time is all kinds of craziness, right? How do we know this? Because the book of Daniel says so. It says the tribulation will last seven years. Pause the video, read it. Daniel 9, 27. Pause your video, read it. It tells you. All right, you should have paused your video and read it. Daniel 9, 27. So this seven-year period will be divided into two halves. Now you can pause your video as I call these scriptures out to you and go look it up. The seven-year period is going to be divided into two halves. The first half lasts 1,260 days, Revelation 11.3. Okay, this is equal to uh, 42 30-day months or three and a half lunar years. Okay, the second half is also going to last 42 lunar months. Now, there's a few scriptures you can stop and look this up. Write it down, Daniel 7.25, Daniel 12.7. Revelation 12, 14, and Revelation 13, 5. All right, the first and second half of the tribulation will be separated by a detestable act Jesus called the abomination of desolations in Matthew 24, 15. All right, Daniel says this desecration of the temple in Daniel 9, 27 is going to launch the second half of the tribulation period. This is a time period known as the great tribulation. So the first three and a half years, you guys, is the tribulation. Okay. The second half of it is called the great tribulation. Okay. The seven year tribulation is the last seven years of a 490 year period found in the book of Daniel. Okay, in it, the angel Gabriel brings a message from God in Daniel 9, verses 20 through 27. He informs Daniel that God has decreed a period of 490 years uh, for the Jewish people to, let's, let's call it out, to number one, finish their rebellion against God. This means Israel will accept Jesus as the Messiah. Number two, to put it into their sin. This means Israel would make a conscious decision to stop sinning. Three, to atone for their guilt. That means Israel will accept the blood of Jesus Christ as payment for their sins. Uh, to uh, bring in everlasting righteousness. It means Israel will witness and usher in the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. To confirm Firm the prophetic vision. That means Israel will witness the final fulfillment of all the messianic prophecies. To anoint the most holy place. It means Israel will witness the anointing of the temple through the arrival of the glorified Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, your temple is your body. Because remember, you remember, Jesus said, I no longer dwell in a, God said, I will no longer dwell in a building. Jesus said, know ye not, your body is the temple. Your body is the temple. I remain in you, in you. It's where the Holy Spirit comes and lives. He lives in here, in your body. Okay? <clears throat> so, according to God, Israel has 490 years to achieve these six objectives. Again, to uh, finish their rebellion against God, to put an end to their sin, atone for their guilt, bring in everlasting righteousness, confirm the prophetic vision, and anoint the most holy place. Israel got 490 years to achieve those six objects. And the countdown started 
with the decree to rebuild Jerusalem in Daniel 9.25. This decree came from King Artaxerxes, I can't pronounce his name, of Persia in 457 B.C. It's in Ezra 7.11-26. All right, since the 490-year uh, countdown started in 457 B.C., it should have ended in A.D. 34, but it didn't. Why? Because Gabriel had something else to say. Okay, he said 483 years would pass from the time the decree is given to rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one comes, the Messiah arrives in Daniel 9.25. This happened when Jesus appeared in the year A.D. 27, okay? So when Jesus appeared, Israel's countdown paused. The crucifixion uh, led to the age of grace, okay, and the tribulation, which is the final seven years, moved to a future time. That time is reserved for the last days, okay? And it's why the tribulation is also called the end times, all right, when it concludes, the nation of Israel will come to believe in Jesus Christ of Nazareth as the Messiah. All right, so what's the purpose of this tribulation? Some people ask, how could a God of love and mercy allow this kind of stuff to happen? And that's a common question during, you know, normal times, but it's especially significant when it comes to the tribulation. Why? Well, because not only are the events of the tribulation especially terrible, but they come directly from God, right? Global turmoil is part of his plan and purpose. So the question remains, why would a loving God allow these things, these bad things, to happen? And the answer is a little different. I'll tell you why. Because the tribulation has more than just one purpose. All right, and for me, I think these are the reasons why. One, put the first reason one, put judgment. The first reason for the tribulation is to bring judgment on a rebellious world. Okay, the Bible calls the tribulation days of wrath, and I've listed all these days over here for you. As you can see. Okay, the days of wrath in Zephaniah 115. Uh, the Bible calls the tribulation... The day of reckoning and the hour of judgment in Revelation 14, 7. All right, the sin of the world demands a response from God, y'all. And by his nature, God is very just. He's just. He, he cannot just let sin go unpunished. He can't and he won't. Proverbs eleven twenty one. 21. The scripture says God is very slow to anger, but his power is great. And he never lets the guilty go unpunished. Never. That's in Nahum 1.3. And they also say God has uh, set a day for judging the world. He has set a day. He has an appointed time for judging the world. Acts 17.31. So eventually, the people of the world will pay the price for their sins that they walk around do every day. <clears throat> the tribulation is that time, y'all. It's the time God has set aside to judge the world. That's what it is. <clears throat> okay. And those who think um, God is harsh, if you think God is harsh, don't understand just how wicked the world is. Just how wicked the world is. Every person is justified in his own eyes. Proverbs 16, 2. But God sees the heart. Proverbs 21, 2. The Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.10. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can forgive sin, Ephesians 1.7. Everyone who rejects Jesus remains under God's judgment, John 3.18-19. But there is no judgment for those who remain in him, Romans 8.1. Why do I teach so hard here, y'all, at We Are Jesus Doers? How to remain in him. How to walk with him. How to abide in him. Why do I teach us so hard? Because there is no judgment for those who remain in him. You understand? Romans 8.1. Trying to help you here. Trying to help you. Okay? 
The end times generation, y'all, will remain under God's judgment. They'll reject Jesus. They'll curse God. It says so in Revelation 16, 9, 11. Paul says they'll love only themselves and their money. You know how many people disobey God's word? Y'all, it's everywhere. Now they put themselves and their money before God. That's why God said do it. They're going to be boastful, proud, disobedient, ungrateful, cruel, undisciplined, unloving, unforgiving, and a whole, whole mess load of terrible things, y'all. 2 Timothy 3, 2-4. through 4. The end times generation is going to deserve every single bit of God's wrath, and history shows us his wrath is very certain to come. All right, God is not an unjust God. He's just. He knows what he's doing, y'all. In Noah's day, God destroyed the earth with a great flood. What was his reason? Why did he do that? Because the earth was filled with violence. Genesis 6, 11. And the thought of its people were continuously evil. Genesis 6, 5. So God judged the world. The world got mad. He destroyed everybody on the earth except for Noah and his family. And since the flood... God has passed judgment on individual cities and nations. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah in judgment in Genesis 19, 24 through 25. He used Nebuchadnezzar to bring judgment on Israel for the worship of false gods and idols, Jeremiah 32, 28 through 35. And he brought judgment on King Belshazzar of Babylon in Daniel 5. And he will bring judgment on the end times generation, you guys. Yes, he will. And it's Rightly so, okay? So, yet, even when God pours out his wrath, his primary purpose is not to destroy, y'all, but to save. But to save, okay? The tribulation is going to have one of two impacts. People are either going to harden their hearts or they'll turn to God for mercy. One of the two. Okay, Bible says so. But also the tribulation is that the last, God's wrath, God's wrath is the last, it may seem hardcore, hardcore, harsh, but it's the last bit. The last bit of God's calling you to him. The last, last bit, last bit of him trying to wake you up. The last chance, it's your last chance. There's no chances after that, y'all. There's no chances after that. So God is calling you here today, today. You know, I see a lot of people out there. I talk to a lot of people, right? Many of you. And I know y'all, demons are run, running rampant on this earth. Yes, your next door neighbor may not even be a human. That's true. That's true. Many weird things on this earth, y'all. Spiritual warfare everywhere, everywhere. All up in your house, everywhere. But I hear a lot of confusion out there. I see People running YouTube channels. I see people in ministries everywhere talking to people like, oh, I'm having all these problems, all these problems. Well, you need to do spiritual warfare prayer. No. No. What you need to do is you need to make sure every single day, every single day, that you are walking in accordance to God's will. That you are honoring God. You're obeying God. You are, you are abiding in him. Make sure of it. Pray it. Search yourself. Search what you do. Am I following God's command? Am I doing what God's told me to do? Am I doing it? Then you can go into spiritual warfare. But that's the first thing you need to figure out, check out, is your walk with God. It's a serious thing, y'all. A lot of people are um, halfway living for the Lord and out there trying to do spiritual warfare battles. And uh, it ain't working very well for you. You get double... The attacks, because when you sin against God, you allow a demon to be there. He has a legal right to be there and torment you. So half of you is worshiping God. The other half of you is not. That demon is going to torment you worse, y'all, for the part of you that is worshiping God. And he got a legal right to be there to do it. So before you go into any spiritual warfare battle or any spiritual warfare videos, the spiritual warfare, y'all, starts with you, with you and your walk with God starts there. You examine your life, yourself, everything you say, think, and do. Examine, does it line up with God? 
Line your life up with God, y'all. Line yourself up with God. Abide in him. Then you can go out there and do all these uh, casting out demons and spiritual warfares out of your life and stuff. That's why I put on my website, JesusDoers.com, some uh, three or four videos on spiritual warfare. It's not just going out there casting out demons. It's making sure you are cleaning up you first so that you can cast out these demons. Make sure you actually are abiding in Jesus Christ. It starts there. It starts there. I heard somebody say that runs a channel out here that God is telling the Christians, the, the messengers like myself, to be silent. God is not telling us to be silent, y'all. God is, That don't even line up with God of the Bible. God is not telling us to be silent. I heard them say, got to be careful, y'all. You really do. There's a lot of people out there running uh, videos and stuff off of their own opinions, their self, and not the Holy Spirit. Be careful. You won't know unless you are really pounding God's word and living it yourself. Letting the Holy Spirit come in, keep you uh, on track. Okay, they said the, the reason why the fall of the nation, the reason why all this deception is happening all over this nation is because of pharmakia. And I'm sorry, that's not right. That's inaccurate. That's not why deception happens at all. Deception happens because somebody ain't walking with the Lord right. It all starts with obedience. If you are obedient to God, you can't be deceived. It can't. You can't be. It won't happen. The deception ain't happening because of pharmacia, y'all. The deception is happening out here because of disobedience to God. That's the truth of God's word right there. I know a lot of you want to listen to what this one says and that one says because it sounds good. But the truth of it is, straight from the throne room, the deception is happening worldwide because of people's disobedience to God, to the Father. That's why. If you are obeying the Lord your God with all your heart and soul because you love him and you're obeying him, y'all, in everything you said to do, you can't be deceived by no pharmakia, by no demon, by no nothing. You can't be deceived, and you won't be. The reason why most of the world is deceived, whether it be by pharmakia or, or uh, ping pong soup, don't matter, it's because of their disobedience to God. More people in this world are walking away from God than with him. So God's not concerned about you doing those spiritual warfare battles, y'all, or sending people you, you talk to out there to spiritual warfare when they don't even, they need to fight the battle, the real battle. They need to face the real battle first, which is their walk with God. See, when you, when you got some sin in your life, Satan has a legal right to be there. Legal right. I'm going to tell you something. If you're living in willful sin, y'all, if you think, well, I, I read the Bible, I go to church, and, you know, I pray sometimes and everything, and I love God, but I don't obey everything he said to do. The Holy Spirit's not there. Not there. Not there. Because you've let sin in there. And I'm going to tell you something. The Holy Spirit and the devil, the Holy Spirit and demons do not reside together in the same house. They don't. They don't. They do not. Sin separates, y'all. You need to understand this. I'm alive on this earth to tell you sin separates you from a holy God. It separates you. Get the sin out of your life. Stop doing it. Get the sin out. It's a choice. You make choices, y'all. It's your choice. Get the sin out of your life. Do all you can do to live your life and abide in Jesus Christ, y'all. Ask God to forgive you. That's true repentance right there when you stop. Holy Spirit's in you. That's your house. You're housing the Holy Spirit. Satan can't get in you, y'all. The demons can't get in you if you keep the door shut. You keep the door shut by obeying God. Y'all be careful out there, y'all. You be careful. Very careful. If I tell you what, where God really is, there ain't going to be a lot of people there. Ain't going to be a lot of people there. Like here, God is here. The Lord Jesus Christ himself is teaching you here through my mouth. But they're out there all over everybody else's junk. That's right. Talking about they thinking it's the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit tells the truth, y'all. Truth. Truth. And the truth is that the world is not being deceived by pharmakia. The world is deceived because of the world's disobedience to God. That's the truth. All right, y'all, go check out JesusDoers.com. Get to checking out your life, your walk with God. Get to checking it out. Self-examination, y'all. Line your life up with the Bible, with Jesus Christ. Get filled with the Holy Spirit and help. Let's, let's help cast these demons out of our life for good and keep them gone. Your spiritual warfare will matter then. All right, in Jesus' name, God bless you. Thanks, some of you, for what you've done. Don't forget Google Meets, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Also, the second class is Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Code is the same, R-A-O-U-B-O-F-M-V-I, always. Okay, it's always the same code. For those of you emailing me still, I tell you every video how to join it. You, you look for the app, search it, look for it, put, type it in Google Meets. Put that code in at those times I told you and come in. All right. Thank you all again. God bless you. Thank you so much for what you did for this ministry, y'all. For me, Igor, Tara, and Brenda, and Lily, thank you so much for helping us back and honoring God's word for his kingdom. All right. The storehouse. Thank you for what you did. Thank you all for my birthday wishes, too. I'm still getting those. Thank you so much, y'all. God bless you. I'll see you later.